please turn again in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, page 771 in the Church Bible. Acts chapter 2, reading from 2 to 32. Acts 2 from verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to the fact. Amen. Now ask Nick to bring the message to us. Let's, let's pray as we come to Psalm 16. Heavenly Father, we do praise you that you raised up the Lord Jesus and that now, even now, he's seated at the right hand, at your right hand in heaven and we ask that you would Pour out the Holy Spirit that you gave to him upon us, that he might be amongst us and that we might know him. We pray that even as the apostles preached Christ from this wonderful part of the Old Testament, so this evening, Jesus would walk with us as he did as a resurrected person in Galilee, opening the Old Testament and pointing us to him through it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So on this uh, Easter Sunday evening, it's good to continue to think about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, certainly, the New Testament is very clear about the resurrection. And yet, as we saw in the Acts 2 reading, and as we've seen in other places this morning, as the apostles preached about the resurrection, they did so, in Paul's words, according to the Scriptures. That is, they preach the resurrection as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So if we're thinking about what the resurrection means, we might well be driven to an Old Testament text. And here in Psalm 16, we're reading from one psalm that particularly the apostles seem to draw on when they speak about the resurrection of Jesus. It was there in Acts 2, we read that extended quote that's taken here from Psalm 16. If you go and read Acts 13 later, you'll see Paul quotes uh, a, a smaller section of that part of Psalm 16, and particularly they seem set on quoting verse 10, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And the Apostles say, this is pointing us to the resurrection of Jesus, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor was he allowed to see decay, but he was raised up to eternal life. <clears throat> Now, perhaps if we're familiar with that proclamation of Acts, 
we might turn back to Psalm 16 expecting the psalm to be in its entirety a resurrection psalm, and yet really the resurrection is more like an element in the psalm. It's an element that sort of builds the bigger theme of confidence in God that we see here. Look at verse 1. David is in some kind of trouble. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. So he's in some kind of trouble and his response is to hide himself in God. That metaphor of taking refuge in God as if he's like a shelter is perhaps one of the great themes of the Psalter. And, and in the Greek translation of, of the Hebrew, often they use that word simply trust. They're saying, what does it mean to trust in God? It means to, to shut yourself up in him like shutting yourself up in a, in a, in a shelter. I don't know where you were in the sort of stormy weather on Thursday morning, but if you were lucky enough to be inside somewhere that was dry, you know what it is to shut yourself in somewhere and to see rain and to whip wind outside and to be glad that you're actually somewhere shut away from it. And David is here saying there's trouble and he's seeking to shelter himself in God, to take refuge in him. And so as we look at Psalm 16 that this evening, we're looking at a psalm that it's really about taking confidence from a world viewed from being hidden in God, from being sheltered in God, and that an element of that confidence is built along the lines of resurrection. We can ask this evening, what did it mean for David to be confident in God, to have that kind of confidence and trust, because he believed in a God who he thought raised the dead? Really, we're asking for ourselves as Christians, what does it mean to believe in the resurrection? And Psalm 16 is going to show us what that's like. Three things, then, that, that come out of this confidence in God we see in Psalm 16. Three words. I think it's probably the best I've ever done an alliteration with the same letter at the beginning. So hopefully this is a memorable outline. Um, I've worked hard at this. Uh, reflection, <laughs> resurrection, and resolution. Reflection. Resurrection and resolution. First, reflection on the goodness of God. See, the Lord, uh, so David, verse 1, shuts himself up in the Lord, and being shut in the Lord, like being shut in that sort of comfy home, he looks around him, and verse 2 reflects on the goodness of his God that he's hidden in. Verse 2, I said to the Lord, or I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. No good thing at all. If you, if you read anything about early philosophy or the early Greek philosophers, this question of what is good is really all that they talk and write about. Everything they talk about, ethics, virtue, or what one ought to pursue, is simply a discussion of what's good. And so Aristotle, in his famous work on ethics, talks about how essentially everyone can agree that we ought to pursue what's good, but they can't make up their mind what the good is. So he writes this, and it sounds very posh, but it's really saying the same thing. Verbally, there is a very general agreement for both the general run of men, that's quite condescending, isn't it? Average people, he says, and people of superior refinement, that's like Aristotle, say that what we ought to seek is the good, and they identify living well and faring well with being happy. But with regard to what the good is, they differ. They can't make up their minds. And the many do not give, they do not give the same account as the wise. So the clever people can't agree with the people who are average people like us. For the former think it, it is in some way plain and obvious, like pleasure, wealth, or honour. So it sounds rather fancy, but as I said before, he's saying we can all agree that we want to live for what's good. We all want to find what's significant. Have you ever met someone who said to you, what, you say, what do you live for? They say, pleasure. Then you can point out to them that, well, that's fine. Of course, everyone lives for pleasure. But what ought you to take pleasure in? What is actually good? You see, no one loves something while thinking it's of no value at the same time, do they? No one brings out to you their, their most beloved possession in which they delight and says to you, look at this wonderful thing, it's worthless, but I love it. 
No, they take pleasure in what they say is good. And so philosophy is debated. What is this good that we're to pursue? And David simply cuts through the whole thing and says, I say to the Lord, you're good. You are my Lord. Apart from you, there is no good thing. There is no good apart from the Lord. You're the good in this life, Lord, David says. You can see that also in verse 5. But I think that the ESV translates a little better here. That It's not that David is saying that you have merely assigned my portion and my cup, but if you've got something like the ESV or maybe the KJV, you'll find it says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup. See, David takes that language of land given to the people of God. When they went to settle, they were given parcels of land, like we'll see in Joshua. This was their their thing to be delighted in, their thing to be loved, a place of delight, a place in Canaan that would be made like Eden. And yet David takes that language, just like the Levites were told to, who didn't get any land, and says, no, my portion, my place of delights, my bountiful land is the Lord himself. Lord, you're my portion and my cup. You're what I get in life, and you're good. Now, how does that fit together with other things we read here? We might think that David is being kind of hyperbolic, if you think about it. It can sound very pious. Lord, you alone are the only good in life. And yet, aren't there other things that are good in life, if we think about it? Aren't there things that we enjoy that we ought to think, yes, that's good too? And in fact, David, we can't press David's words to to mean something so hyperbolic, because... He delights in other things too, verse 3. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. David delights in the Lord, but he also delights in God's people. Verse 5 and 6 as well, I think he moves beyond just the Lord as his lot to speak more generally, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Now he might just simply be saying it's good to have God as my God. But he can't, I can't help but think that he's moved beyond that to say, in general, the Lord is good, but the Lord's given me good things as well. He delights in God, but because he delights in God, he delights in the people of God, who are being made like the Lord. And he delights in the gifts of God, things that he receives daily, things that he has. How do we fit that together? David says, I have no good besides you. And yet he's delighting in other things that he says are good. Well, that's not very difficult, is it? It's simply that he wants to say, Lord, you are the center. You are the only source of what is good in this life. And if anything is taken and abstracted, if anything is removed from you, it's no longer good. You see, there are good things. But they're only good insofar as that they are coming down from the Father of lights in heaven, as James says. Good gifts from him. And as we appreciate them coming from him, then we say, these are good. Because you're good. <coughs> I don't know if you've had a, a chance to, uh, to go on the walk that's uh, by the Waiho River in Patarudu. There's a, there's a nice little walk by a river. Anyone been down there? Family in the Waikato, you get to do these kinds of things. It's very flat, it's a very easy walk, I recommend it. And you, you walk by the river there, and it's basically all been tricked out, so you don't have to climb anything, and it's easy walking, and it stops you from slipping over because they've got all that fancy matting. And it's a decent length of walk. And at one end, there's a particular attraction that people go to see, which is called the Blue Spring. There's a spring there that uh, is, is water that's coming out of the rock straight into the river. And it comes out at something like 9,000 gallons a minute. So it's really, it's really shifting some water. And the water that's coming into the river has actually never been at the surface for around about 100 years. So the last time that water came up, it was 19-something you know, rather than 20-something. The water has, has been underground in a rock. And because it's percolated through the rock, all of the particles that we normally get in water have been taken out. And so because it doesn't have any particles and because pure water absorbs red light, 
the water is really bright blue. It's that kind of bright blue that postcards amp up the colour to make water look like, and normally just looks so unnatural. And yet there, it really is almost bright blue, like some sort of gem. So this water comes out entirely pure, bright blue, because of where it's been. It emerges out of this rock, flows out, and so itself is characterised by cleanness and purity. And in the same way, David is saying here, I delight in the good things of God. Why? Because they flow out of a God who is himself alone good. There is no other source of good in the universe. All good, in that sense, is derivative good. And so he delights in it. If then God alone is good and the things that come from him alone are good, what is it then to walk away from God? Or to try to take things and abstract them from God, verse 4, it is sorrow. See, to try to find good away from God in this life, no, there's no good. It's only sorrow. The sorrows of those will increase who just pursue, who run after other gods. There's no good there. And so David says, no, I'm hiding myself in God. I'm hiding myself in the one who is the source of all goodness, and in whom is found all delight. You see, what does it mean then to embrace that kind of piety that we see in David here? It's very simple, but I think it's something that we get away from. <coughs> that as we receive good things in this life, the most basic things of food, of shelter, of warmth, of clothing, of friends, of family, of anything we enjoy, just even today, perhaps we had time to spend with family. Or perhaps we had special food for Easter. David encourages us to receive those things and to say to ourselves, this is a good thing that is only coming to me because it comes from the one who is himself goodness. This is a sign of God's goodness to me. It's but a derivation. And if it is good because it only comes from God, if this is good, this thing in my hands, how much better must be the one in heaven. You are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. Lord, you're the centre of goodness. You see, we, we believe, we trust, when we receive every good thing from God and say, well, this is from you. But also when we then reject the whispers of Satan, who say the exact opposite, who say that if you are receiving good, this must be something God doesn't want you to have. Or if you are receiving good, then it would be better perhaps to enjoy that. It would be more enhanced to enjoy that away from God. God is going to restrict that good in some way. So take it away, move it away. And yet David shows us there's no greater antidote to sin but to lift these things up to God and say, no, this is from you. The place of enjoyment is in you, never in abstraction from you, literally never against you or beside you. <clears throat> We're to step into the light of God's presence and as Paul says, to take what is good and to sanctify it with thanksgiving and prayer. Ever thought that that was a strange passage? Paul saying, sanctify something? You're receiving God's good gifts of marriage, of food, of friendship. And yet also we sanctify them by saying, no, Lord, yes, this is from you, and I receive it as from you. Augustine said, he who loves anything not for your sake loves you poorly, O Lord. And David says, he who sees, he says the flip side, he who sees everything is coming from God that's good, loves God well, because we say, Lord, in you alone is good. David reflects on God's goodness, good, God's goodness, and he sees that goodness as a reflection of God. So his confidence is built here on the goodness of God, but as he, as he moves from reflecting, he moves to resurrection, resurrecting. Because he sees that that goodness is a goodness that can never stop. 
You might think David's party here seems a little bit rose-tinted. Lord, you alone are good. You're always good. Remember hearing Africans sing, God is good all the time, all the time God is good. That was the great sort of antiphonal thing you'd hear in East Africa. Is that sort of rose-tinted to say that? And yet David knows, doesn't he? Verse 1, where is he saying about the God, God's goodness from? Keep me safe. I need a refuge, Lord. I'm in danger. Even in the midst of danger, he's confessing the goodness of God. And in fact, he's confessing the goodness of God in the midst of the worst kind of danger. In the midst of the danger of death. Verses 7 to 10. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. <coughs> you see, surely the greatest challenge to God's goodness is death. Death that cuts us off from one another, the goods of, of friendship and family. Death that <coughs> seems to cut us off from all the goods in the world. And death that speaks over us and, and sounds like, and was originally meant to me, you are cut off from God. You are cut off from the good things of God and you are cut off from the good God. And yet David says, I'm confident. I'm confident in the face of death that God will not abandon me. That not even death can sever me from his goodness. And so he's confident and he rejoices. I look to the Lord and I won't be shaken, he says. Now those very verses, verse Verses 7 to 10 are the verses that the apostles quote. As we read in Acts 2, when they quote them, they say David was speaking about Jesus when he said this. And yet, I don't know if you're like me, when you read those verses, it seems like, isn't David speaking about himself? You will not abandon, verse 10, me to the grave. Perhaps we might try to bury it in the next phrase, nor will you let your Holy One. Oh, maybe he's talking about someone else. And yet in Hebrew poetry, almost always the lines are balanced. And so we're meant to read, you will not abandon me, that is David, to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One, that is David the King, as the Holy One of God, see decay. David is saying, God, you won't abandon me. And yet the apostles say he was speaking about Jesus. How do we fit that together? We have to. We have to. The apostles are telling us how to read Psalm 16. So how do we do it? Well, it's not just a technical exercise. There's great encouragement here, I think, as we see David expressing his trust in God. You see, if we're to take the apostles seriously when they say, this is about Jesus, we have to say that. David is speaking about Jesus. How is he doing it? See, the apostles are absolutely right that this cannot apply in an ultimate sense only to David. Remember how they argue? David says, you won't abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy one see decay. And the apostles say, where is David? He went to the grave. He saw decay. It can't ultimately be just about him. You see, there's only one holy one of God who went to the grave and yet didn't stay there. Who went to the grave and yet never went back to the dust. Who went to the grave and yet his body was kept uncorrupted and was raised to life. There's only one saint, one holy one, who ever saw that, Jesus. And the apostles see it in Psalm 16 and they say, Here is a faithful God whose word cannot fall to the ground. <laughs> This is about Jesus Christ who was raised up, who never saw decay and never will. His own body now stands in heaven, a human body, perfect. He saw death, but it never triumphed over him. The goodness of God raised up Jesus Christ. And yet, this is about David somehow. You see, if it isn't about David somehow, as well, I just don't see how it isn't a kind of trickery. Well, I'm saying me, but really I mean someone else. 
It's the kind of thing that doesn't work very well with an employer. You say, I took the pencils. Well, when you mean me, I mean someone else took them. It's not going to fly, is it? If David says me, he must mean me somehow. And the apostles tell us how. They say he was looking forward to the son that he would have. The son God had promised him who would reign on the throne forever. Now, if his son would reign forever on the throne, he has to be raised. He has to be eternal. Otherwise, death would end that reign. And so David here is speaking, yes, about his son. He's saying he will reign forever. He won't be corrupted. And yet he's saying, because of my son, neither will I. What's true for my son, he says, will be true for me. Now, again, you could try to say, well, that's because he sees himself as sort of living on in name only. But no, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you will not abandon my lineage to the grave, but you won't abandon me to the grave. He's saying, because I have a son who will live forever, somehow too I'm going to live. I may go back to the dust, but I too will be raised incorruptible. And you see then David is saying, what's true for Jesus Christ, only in an ultimate sense, will be true for me too, in a derivative way. David said, I'm connected to Jesus Christ, my son, and so I'll be raised too, just as he was raised. And that means that like David, we too can take the words of this psalm and say, this is about you, you and I too. Not, not as the ultimate one. It's not about you or I or David as opposed to being about Jesus. But because it applies to Jesus, it's true for you too. You can take up these words and speak them as your own. You see, there's already a little echo here that says, this applies to more than one person. It applies to Jesus, and so it applies to you, because he won it for you. You can take up these words and say, not even death will cut me off from the goodness of God. You will not abandon me to the grave. You will not let me ultimately just see decay, but you'll raise me up. You see, we see that note all through the New Testament. Who is the one of Genesis 3 who crushes the serpent's head? Well, isn't it Jesus? It is. And yet Paul says, believers crush Satan's head in Romans. Who is the son of Psalm 2 to whom the father says, you are my son, and I'll be your father? Well, it's Jesus, isn't it? And yet John in Revelation writes that it's believers. And David here seems the same thing. Jesus is the ultimate holy one. And yet in him we get raised too. We don't see decay. We share in it with him. Who can separate us from the love of God? In Christ Jesus, Paul says. And David says, nothing. Nothing can separate you and I from the goodness of God. So he reflects confidently in the goodness of God and he's confident even in the face of death that even that great severer won't keep him from God. How should we respond to that? So he's brought us to personal faith in the resurrection, <coughs> here, hasn't he? He believes, even ahead of time, how much more we believe, we see it opened up, we see how it plays out. We see one who's already been raised to the Father's right hand <coughs> and saying, I'm going there. He wasn't kept from the Father's goodness. And so I won't be too. And David believed ahead of time. And also he responded. He lived a life in the power of the resurrection ahead of time. And, and what does it look like? Very briefly. Reflection, resurrection, and, and this great note that really runs through the whole thing here. Resolution. David is resolved. If you look at verse 4. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods... I will not pour out their libations. I won't pour out drink offerings of blood. I will not take up their names on my lips. You see, David, knowing that God is good and that he can't be taken away from that goodness, 
knows the triumph of God in him against Satan. Again, as we said before, what is Satan's strategy in the garden? What is Satan's strategy out of the garden but to say, would you have goodness? Would you pursue what all men and women pursue? Then go away from God. He will keep goodness from you, and he will keep you from it. And David says, nonsense. He will even raise me up in order to be good to me. He will, and so I won't. I will not. I won't go somewhere else. I won't go somewhere else. You promised me something better, Satan. You promised me a better life. But my Father in heaven has shown me the path of life, verse 11. And what's it like with him in his presence is fullness of joy, eternal pleasures at his right hand forevermore. You see, the good things of this life don't just reflect the derivative goodness of God in heaven. They don't just point up, they point forward. At his right hand in the new world is pleasure forevermore. Joy at his right hand in his presence. Satan offers us a good life, but God here shows us the path to life. David's convinced of the goodness of God. Convinced that he can't be taken away from it. And so he says, I'm not going anywhere. He's resolved. <clears throat> See, this isn't a psalm about resurrection, but one that includes it. And ultimately, it's confidence in the goodness of God and confidence that you as a believer can never be taken away from it. And so our only response can then to be like David, to believe as he did and to say, I set the Lord always before me. I will bless the Lord at all times. And I will not go after other gods. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you that in Jesus Christ we come home to you who is goodness himself. And we thank you that he was cast off for a time from you. That we might never be cast off. And that he was raised up into your holy presence whether now he is happy with you at your right hand, filled with pleasure and joy, so that we might go there too. And we thank you that even now, even today, you've poured out good <coughs> gifts on us from heaven, and we confess, Lord, with David, that they're but a mere reflection of your eternal goodness. And Lord, we ask, even this evening, whet our appetites, that we might long to be with Jesus where he is, and we thank you that he has been raised, that we might be guaranteed to go there. And we ask, Lord, that you'd send us home tonight with these words on our hearts, that you'll never abandon us. That we may be in the grave for a while, and a while may pass by, but you won't leave us there. You'll raise us up, so that we won't eternally see decay. We ask this, that even now, in advance by your Spirit, you might fill us with pleasure, in anticipation of your right hand. And so we pray it all being filled with joy and filled with confidence, we might say no to ungodliness. We might say today and tomorrow no to Satan. And that we might shun all his works. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.